Hey you, Bravo's now in Canada. I just got chills. If you know Bravo, I love that. I love love that. that. You love that. You know. Vanderpump Rules. Why does it have to get so complicated? Summer House. Don't activate me because you've not seen me activated. Below Deck. I'm not your friend. I'm your captain. Top Chef. Hi, Chef. And Housewives. <gasps> Definitely Housewives. I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to this. Bravo. Now available. This is safe. Subscribe now with your TV service provider. Fall in Canada has never been hotter. Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter. Podcasts that resonate. The title government consultant can cover a lot of ground. Everything from an individual expert to the world's largest, most prestigious, and most expensive consulting firm. But when you are a government hiring that world-renowned firm, you should be aware that they have other clients. Clients that might have goals that differ from yours, especially when it comes to clean energy oil and gas, and pipelines. Now, is that a conflict of interest? Did the government hand out millions of dollars to McKinsey and company without considering that? Did they need to spend tens of millions of dollars to ask the firm how to cut costs on a project that was already billions over budget? And do you think that they have a solid answer? to any of those questions. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Mike D'Souza is the Director of Enterprise and Investigations at the Narwhal. Hey, Mike. Hi, Jordan. Thanks for finding time for us for this one. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Why don't you start for those uh, who are unfamiliar and may uh, maybe only heard the name or not know much about what actually happens here. What is McKinsey and Company and like, what do they actually do? So the short answer is they are consultants for decades. They have advised all of the top companies around the world, as well as all pretty much every government around the world or government department, providing any advice that any of these organizations or governments seek, whether it's about uh, how to better manage their resources, how to better manage staff, how to save money. Uh, In some cases, it's marketing advice. Sometimes it's public relations advice. So it's a wide range of of things that uh, support services that they offer as consultants to help businesses or governments operate uh, more efficiently or better. And you're currently uh, reporting on, I guess, a couple of contracts that McKinsey got from the Canadian government. Can you explain uh, what what we've, I say we, because it's my money too, uh, what we've hired them to do? So a range of government uh, departments, agencies, or, or crown corporations have been paying McKinsey and company for a number of years to do consulting work. Right. The Auditor General uh, a few months ago produced a report that looked at a bunch of contracts over the year and, 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 and found that Canadian taxpayers have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on a range of contracts to McKinsey for advice. We don't always know details of exactly what, what advice they provided. The Office of the Auditor General itself said in a lot of cases, we don't know if if we're getting value for money or whether these contracts were even needed. In terms of the reporting that I did, to start, I looked at a contract that was issued to help the government prepare for the 2023 budget. And this was a contract that was issued to McKinsey so that the government could get advice, particularly on its environmental or green or clean energy, clean tech type of policies. Right before, a few months before, uh, you might recall, Jordan, that the White House, the Biden-Harris White House, had adopted what they called the Inflation Reduction Act, which was essentially the signature climate change legislation of the Biden-Harris White House. It was a game changer. I think even the, the Canadian government calls it a game changer for clean tech or clean energy in that it was suddenly providing these major incentives for clean tech growth, for for renewables, just to shift production 
and energy generation away from fossil fuels and 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 favoring clean energy and offering all kinds of subsidies to shift and transition the economy. So it created a situation where the Canadian companies in clean tech and clean energy, in order to compete with the U.S., they needed to really up their game and deliver a much better market and conditions for, for those companies to be attracted to Canada and, and to come to Canada and create jobs in Canada. So this first contract in fall of 2022 was issued to McKinsey to get advice on what the government could do, what it could introduce in its in its 2023 budget that would now allow Canada to compete more effectively with the U.S. And do we know, like, what kind of uh, results came out of that? Do we know what McKinsey advised them to do and what happened? No, we, we don't. So, I mean, I tried to get a copy of, of the report and advice uh, through Freedom of Information. Uh, the government redacted or censored the entire report, and they did not answer questions when I when I tried to ask uh, exactly what did McKinsey tell you to do and how did it change what policies they ended up introducing. Right, but you also looked into, and I I gather this is not even you know that secret. Who else McKinsey has worked with uh, in this area, and what did you find? A number of potential conflicts, essentially. McKinsey has represented some of the biggest oil companies in the world. Through other court proceedings, they've been required to submit affidavits to various courts in the U.S. that list their clients. And so looking through some of those court affidavits, I was able to confirm a number of of prominent Canadian oil and gas companies on their list of clients that includes some of the biggest oil producers in Canada, such as Suncor Energy, Synovus, Canadian Natural Resources Limited. You know, the list The list goes on. It, and, it, and it also includes a number of big corporations in Canada that finance fossil fuels, like the big banks. Each, each of the five big banks are also clients of, of McKinsey, and they all have interests in seeing government policies that protect fossil fuels or that assist fossil fuels. So there is a bit of a conflict here in terms of if you're entrusting McKinsey to give you advice as a government about how to promote clean energy, and that firm is providing advice at the same time we're getting paid by companies that don't necessarily want those government policies in place, you have a bit of a conflict there, or at least an appearance of a conflict. Why would the government offer this contract to a client who has been working with uh, all these oil and gas companies? Did they disclose it? Like, do we know if there were conversations that went on there or what? In terms of why they why they offered it, I, I would say, Jordan, that's the $1.3 million question, given right. that this contract was, was for $1.3 million. Um, McKinsey, after a lot of back and forth, eventually told me that they did disclose conflicts, both actual and perceived. When I asked the follow-up of exactly what those conflicts were, they didn't, they didn't give details. The government also didn't confirm or didn't answer specifically what they said or what they did with that information, other than that they reviewed it prior to moving ahead with the contract. They also said there was a certain urgency. This was happening around late November, December 2022, and they needed they needed the advice, they say, uh, so that they could prepare the budget, which would have come out a few months later, uh, I think in late March or early April, if I'm not mistaken. So they essentially needed, they needed the advice like yesterday, and that's why they say they rushed. But the other thing is, like, there's some interesting things that happened that, that the, you know, even the Auditor General kind of flagged that it was Finance Canada, the Finance Department, the, the Department of uh, Deputy Prime Minister Christopher Freeland, that wanted this advice, but their own procurement rules prevented them from issuing it themselves. So they used the Crown Corporation, the Canada Development Investment Corporation, to issue the contract. They did it in a matter of four days. They issued an open call for, for tenders. 
posting, you know, asking firms to bid. They got some bids and then they chose McKinsey. And it's not clear why they chose McKinsey. It's not clear whether there were other firms that didn't have conflicts that were turned down. So there's a whole lot of questions that the government doesn't want to answer about this. And in the meantime, there is a second contract with McKinsey, right? Can you explain that one? And that one's for even more money. Yeah, so there is. Um, and this one also was flagged in the Auditor General's report from, from June. Trans Mountain Corporation issued a $32 million contract. It was also issued in that same period, October 2022. So for $32 million, they gave a sole source contract, so not even any open competition on it to McKinsey. When I asked about this, Trans Mountain told me that the reason for this contract was to help them control costs on on the pipeline. Now, as you know, Jordan, the Canadian government bought the Trans Mountain assets and the pipeline right. a few years ago. They spent about, I think it was $4.5 billion to buy the pipeline. Pipeline was initially, when it was owned privately, when it was first proposed, that pipeline project was supposed to cost about $5 billion. It ended up costing well over $30 billion. So they said they issued this contract in 2022. I mean, at that point, we already knew the the pipeline project was going well over budget, but they said that this was to allow them to find ways to save more money. So their solution to that was paying McKinsey, $30 million, $32 million for advice on how to how to reduce those costs. But at least there's no conflict with this one, right? <laughs> well, those same oil companies that McKinsey represents, some of them are also right now in a dispute with Trans Mountain over tolls. So because of the cost overruns, Trans Mountain has been trying to recover some of the costs Uh, by increasing the toll. So the oil companies, to ship oil on the pipeline, they pay a toll, which then Trans Mountain collects, and that helps cover their costs. And it also would theoretically help, it could help Trans Mountain make money or make a profit. Right now, there aren't really any profits in Trans Mountain because they have to pay for all of these costs of of building the, the Trans Mountain expansion. So McKinsey was giving advice or being paid by some of the oil companies. We don't know what for, but they had different contracts with with some of these oil companies that are now in a dispute with Trans Mountain over the tolls. So the the oil companies are arguing against the the proposal for toll hikes. Trans Mountain is trying to push it through. You know, ultimately, even if these even if these toll hikes are pushed through, it still leaves a bit of a gap for taxpayers and taxpayers kind of footing the bill for, for all of these significant costs uh, that, that we paid to build this pipeline. But ultimately, yeah, there is, there is still a bit of an appearance of a conflict and we do have a lot, of, a lot more questions than we have answers about what McKinsey was advising these companies on and whether there's any kind of connection between those contracts and the work it was doing for Trans Mountain. Right. And I guess what I would like to know is, you know, as you mentioned kind of off the top, McKinsey works with everyone, as all the big companies, lots of governments, et cetera, et cetera. Surely they end up in these situations. What do they say about how they manage uh, this kind of appearance of conflict and uh, whether or not they did in, explain it in terms of this case in detail, but just in general, how do they approach that? Because it must happen. Yeah, so... McKinsey gave me some some general statements saying that they disclose all conflicts. They also make the point that because of all the work they do for so many different clients, it certainly gives them a, a level of expertise about how things work. It gives them expertise and exposure to to a wide range of stakeholders across the economy and across governments. So they they argue that they they disclose conflicts, that they have certain processes in place to avoid conflicts. I mean, McKinsey does employ hundreds of people in Canada. So we don't know that necessarily the consultants that are working on one contract for the oil companies are also working on the contracts for the government. But we also don't know whether, you know, if they are indeed separate consultants working on the different contracts, we don't know what kind of communication goes on between. Like they say that they do put up different 
policies in place to prevent conflicts, but there's a bit of a gray area and, 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 and a bit of a mystery about how that all works with a firm like McKinsey and with all of these and these contracts that kind of extend out like, you know, tentacles, like, you know, it's, it's not just an octopus with eight arms. It's, it has many different, many different arms and, and paths and links that would take hours and hours or days and weeks just to dig into all the different connections that exist with a company like McKinsey. So to be clear, we got these two contracts and uh, they're both coming from the government. And there is, as you mentioned, the appearance of conflict of interest uh, between some of the clients that McKinsey has had and and, uh, the government's stated goals. I guess what I want to know from you lastly is like, what could the government do here? or What are you still trying to find out? How much do we not know yet? Well, there's a lot. I mean, a few years ago, I believe it was in 2021, a bunch of McKinsey consultants drafted this open letter. They drew attention to the fact and they criticized their own firm for the work it was doing with fossil fuel companies. They were concerned that McKinsey was doing work that was facilitating, enabling the status quo in terms in terms of allowing this unabated growth of fossil fuels that was failing to address the impact that this industry is having on, on, on the climate. So they, they asked their own firm to take a step back, take a look at what it was doing, and to start doing different types of work to, to be part of the solution. McKinsey says it was, says that it does try to work with these firms to, to move them towards transitioning. But when you see conflicts like this, again, it raises all these questions. And for the government, I think they need to come clean with exactly what they discussed with McKinsey. You know, for starters, it would be nice if they did interviews. You know, I asked all kinds of questions back and forth several times to the to the finance minister's office. And at a certain point, they just started ghosting me. They They weren't even answering my emails. And I think it's important that maybe the minister needs to needs to be available to answer questions about what did she know about what advice McKinsey had provided? Did she challenge whether McKinsey had any conflicts? What was in the report they gave? And how was that report influenced by by what McKinsey knows or or does or the business it does with the oil companies? What kind of exposure did renewables? And, and you know, McKinsey does have clients in clean tech as well. So could some of them have been favored over others? Are there new technologies, new firms that are just not getting attention from government that should be getting attention that might actually have the solution. So there's a whole range of questions that the government can answer just by being a little more transparent. And I'm sure the answers to all those questions are forthcoming, Mike, just as soon as we finish this podcast. (laughs) I'll keep digging, Jordan. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Mike D'Souza of the Narwhal. That was the big story. You can find more big stories at thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can comment on any of our stories or suggest some of your own you'd like to hear on this show by emailing us at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by leaving a voicemail at 416-935-5935. You can find this podcast wherever you listen to them. And if the app you're using allows you to rate and review A reminder from us that that helps other people find this show too, and we deeply appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.